Okie dokie, so I'm going to do a brief um, chapter 11 lecture. Okay, so um, first the chapter looks at a brief history of feminism in the United States because it's kind of hard to understand the theory without understanding the history. So feminism is the belief that women and men are of inherently equal worth. So most scholars contend that feminism itself has evolved in three major waves. So the first wave of feminism started in the mid-1800s when women demanded the right to vote. So in 1848, approximately 300 women and men met in Seneca Falls, New York at the Seneca Falls Convention. And a lot of people consider this to be kind of like the turning point in a movement specifically dedicated to the rights of women, as a lot of women that were involved in this movement were also abolitionists or involved in other social movements at the time. So they, they drafted what's called the Declaration of Sentiments, which stressed the need for reforms in marriage, divorce, property, and child custody laws. So in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was passed, and that gave women the right to vote. And with the passage of the 19th Amendment, many suffragists believed that women had indeed become men's equal because they were actually able to enter the political realm, which obviously has a lot of power and influence when it comes to being a citizen. So the second wave um, developed mostly in the 1960s when other marginalized groups were also challenging the status quo, such as the civil rights movement, um, anti-war movement, those kind of things. So feminists of this wave argued that in order to be fully liberated, women needed to have equal access to economic opportunities and sexual freedoms, as well as civil liberties. So some women Really, basically, this idea of a liberal agenda is having, you know, the idea that you should change the structure of the system in order to better benefit women and not just men. So um, we'll get into that in a minute. But during this time period, there's a liberal perspective, a radical perspective. They all kind of developed out of the same movements and oftentimes college student movements of the 60s and 70s. So many liberal feminists uh, joined groups that were organized at the time, such as uh, the National Organization for Women. So, um, you know, in these groups, they were able to kind of collectivize and organize in order to bring about activism and social movements for change within the system. So it was in this social context and within these emerging political perspectives that feminist criminology began to question assumptions and stereotypes concerning women in criminal justice. So this also includes having women as professionals in the fields where they were often underrepresented. So obviously, it, when it comes to being in the criminal justice system, you know, being, um, being lawyers, being judges, you know, um, and then of course, they were also looking at women as offenders, um, the kind of perceptions that there were, the gendered biases, those kind of things, the way that women were treated differently than men within the system. And of course, women as victims of crime, as there's a lot of crimes that are perpetuated where women are predominantly the victims of those crimes. So that's really where this is kind of, you know, out of the second wave, a lot of the early um, feminist criminology, uh, criminological theory was developing. So the third wave of feminism evolved around the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so this wave is an extension, obviously, as well as a response to the shortcomings of second wave. So during second wave, you have movements for basically women to push into realms that were considered male at the time, such as, you know, work, so that overall economy push, but also, you know, education, sports, all sorts of realms of life that were considered predominantly for men. And so, you know, a lot of these things and reforms were changed and pushed through. But of course, in the early 1980s, um, there was this kind of moral majority, quote unquote, movement that countered a lot of the rights that had been achieved by feminists in the second wave, such as abortion access, birth control, um, you know, because they believed in sexual freedom, meaning being able to have sex without worrying about having a child. Uh, the concept of family planning, where people that are married and having, you know, um, families that still they should have the choice over how large their family is. And so, you know, a lot of those kind of things are going to inform what we'll talk about later. All right. So third wave is really just trying to kind of can kind of advance what was not finished of second wave, but also really look more at, you know, uh, diversity, difference. Um, not being what was now, we you know, we now have a term called white feminism that's kind of 
that idea of embracing not just the perspective of predominantly white middle class or upper middle class women, but also what the experiences are specifically of women of color, of trans women, of, you know, women that are queer, of whatever it might be, right? Because, you know, instead of just focusing specifically on, like, the what's considered the dominant group. So more than any other group of feminists, Third Wave has really provided a voice for many women who otherwise did not identify with, you know, previous feminist perspectives, especially women of color. So, okay, first a couple key terms, pretty basic stuff. Um, sex is the differences that refer to the biological differences um, that people have and like hormonal differences, these kind of things. We tend to think of it as a binary in our culture, right? Male or female. But technically, biologically, there are five sexes. So <laughs> even the idea of sex itself is socially constructed. Um, gender, of course, is the social construction of what it means to fit that, you know, societally prescribed bi binary. So meaning what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, right? So it's the social definition of a man or a woman. Chivalry is this, it pertains to behaviors and attitudes that, you know, basically you treat people in a way as if they are on a pedestal. So if you engage in a chivalrous relationship, this usually means that, you know, it's, it implies a power differential, right? In which men hold more power and status than women. So like one of those things that we consider chivalrous is men to hold doors open for women. But in reality, in the history of why that came about as a practice, it's because during the Victorian era, it was believed that women should take up as less, you know, the least amount of space possible. So oftentimes women's arms were sewn up to the elbow into the sides of their dresses, um, making this a uh, possibility to like take up the least amount of space as possible. So it was very difficult for women to, you know, extend their arm, twist a doorknob and pull a door towards them if they're in very restrictive clothing. So men had to open women or had to open doors for women so, because they were able-bodied, right? And so it's interesting how that kind of evolved into this practice where we get really weird about who opens the door for who. Like often I'll open the door for people and like dudes will get upset about it sometimes, which is super weird because like for me, I'm like, if I'm at a door and I have it open and you're coming through, I'm just trying to save you the labor of opening a door, right? But really it comes back to this idea that there was an unequal dis distribution of power between men and women and so you know men would defer in a gentlemanly way to help a woman but then really just implying that power difference right that women needed help so um you know we'll get back to how this applies within the criminal justice system so paternalism is this idea that you know again kind of chivalry is being nice on account of power differences paternalism is really the idea that you know, I need to do something for you, for your own good, right? Like what I'm doing is to protect you, whether you, you know, consent to that or not. So in a broad social context, paternalism implies independence for men and dependence for women, right? So this idea that, um, you know, for example, when um, George W. Bush talked about going into Afghanistan, part of the logic that he used within the speech um, before the invasion was that we need to liberate all of these women um, within Afghanistan that were being treated terribly, which of course they were. But are they now not being treated terribly? No, <laughs> of course not, right? That wasn't really what the goal was at all. But it was a paternalistic logic, like, right? We have to come and save these women. It's the same logic a lot of Republicans, um, Congress people are used to deny women access to, um, you know, their own health services, right? trying to say like, oh, well, you're just protecting a woman, right? By, by telling her that she should have to, before she's able to legally get an abortion, she has to hear a fetal heartbeat, wait 48 hours, and then come back and get the abortion. So it's, again, but it's, you're doing it for her own good, right? You're just trying to protect her. But again, it's just this assumption that, you know, someone is more powerful and that, you know, men are independent. They can make their own decisions. Women can't make their own decisions. Someone needs to help them. Right. And then patriarchy just refers to a subordinate role of women. So just really it's a system of an equal power where men have power over women. So patriarchy is social. It makes its way into our institutions like the legal system and of course the political climate itself. So that those things all become based on this idea of hierarchy where men are at the top of that hierarchy.
All right, so when it comes to feminist perspectives on gender, um, traditional or conservative perspective really just kind of highlights this idea that gender inequality is just due to biological sex differences and hormonal differences. So basically, they try to say that gender is formed just based off of biology. So like you're born and like women are just born um, caring or, you know, um, they're just so loving or whatever the crap. And that men are just born like tough and aggressive and blah, whatever. So, um, you know, conservative perspective doesn't offer any strategies for social change because they say this is just a, a evolutionary biology or this is just an adaptation to sex differences, right? And they don't see how, yeah, the social imposition. Um, liberal feminism really, you know, something that's kind of considered the mainstream feminism. If you've heard about feminism, you've probably heard about liberal feminism. Um, they really believe in this idea of, you know, liberty, equality, justice, dignity, and rights. So a major feature of it is that women should have the same treatment and rights as men do. So the perspective argues that gender inequality, it doesn't come from biology. It comes from women's blocked opportunities to participate in lots of aspects of the public sphere, such as education, employment, political activities. Of course, you can see how this comes out of the second wave. So strategies for social change, you know, are to free women from oppressive gender roles so that they're able to actually have the same power and status as men do. So, you know, basically they, um, they really argue to support kind of the existing structure, but just to adapt it, right? Um, for radical feminism, um, this evolves again out of the same kind of rights movements but emphasizes on the importance of experiences and relationships and, you know, feelings that people have that they've, of things that they've gone through. And they argue that gender is a system of male dominance, right? So again, this kind of patriarchal influence has shaped society in a lot of ways. So they say the cause of gender inequality is based on the needs or desires of men to control women's sexuality and reproductive potential, which <laughs> seems super timely right now with the healthcare stuff. But anyway, so this process of gender formation, they argue, is founded on these power relationships between men and women in which boys and men, you know, are just socialized to view themselves as superior to and having the right to control girls and women and their sec sexuality, their reproduction, right? I mean, obviously, if you look at advertising, that's a great example of how our culture is training us to see women as sexual objects that men are there to consume. So radical feminists argue that, you know, sexism is this widespread form of human oppression that kind of is spread across a lot of societies and cultures. So um, basically they think that, that uh, you know, these kind of gendered notions are, are very uh, polarizing for a lot of people. All right, Marxist and socialist feminism so first, Marxist feminism is really just looking at, at the same kind of feminist liberation theory stuff coming out of the 60s and 70s, but from a perspective of the kind of economic um, connections, right? So how Marx often looked at this idea of, um, you know, the haves and the haves nots, the, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and how, um, you know, they just kind of place women within that framework, right? Showing how... You know, the majority of work within the home that's not paid is expected to be on women, right? That men dominate the economic and political sphere, which totally is true to this day. Um, so that they argue that the causes of gender inequality come from the hierarchical relationships of control. And of course, specifically of control of private property and ownership, how so much of the economy and the political power is consolidated in the hands of men. So they talk about how class relationships are the primary focus and gender relationships are secondary focus, unlike radical feminists that think gender is the primary focus. So basically, they're trying to look at work-related inequality and understanding the trivialization of, of women's work in the home, right? So this idea that like, the women tend to be concentrated in the lowest paid jobs, lowest status, and that um, they're expected to do all the unpaid labor at home, like cleaning crap, uh, taking care of kids, all that kind of stuff. 
So socialist feminism is really just kind of a blending of radical and Marxist together. So they're trying to integrate the ideas of male domination and those political economic relationships, focusing on gender, class, and racial relations of domination, right? So this is kind of the early, early um, version of intersectionality, right? So um, they consider, again, class and gender relationships to be the primary issues. So um, they have two general themes. One that there's, you know, this explanation of women's oppression in one system. And then they talk about, you know, these ideas that patriarchy, not capitalism, may be the worst issue that women face. But they, you know, kind of blend this into what they call capitalist patriarchy or patriarchal capitalism. So again, the link between the economic. Okay, um, just a couple more. Postmodern feminism is more of a contemporary movement that has modified and adapted some of the previous feminist theories. Um, so really, it rejects the traditional assumptions about truth and reality. And, you know, this idea of postmodernism in general, people have a hard time explaining it. It's just kind of this idea that, like, what is truth, what is knowledge, what is said is accepted is often, um, you know, when we look back, like, 100 plus years, you can see that in medical literature, they said that if a woman was able to read, it would affect her ability to reproduce. We know that's not true right now, but at the time, that was considered fact. So postmodernists are really looking at, like, how can we really trust our modern social institutions just as fact when we can see in the past they clearly weren't just objective, that they were influenced by the sexism, the classism, the racism, whatever it is, of the time period in which they were built right? Like all men are created equal, right? Those kind of things that shows clearly, a, you know, if that came of a time period of, you know, gender egalitarian views, it would be all people are created equal, right? But still, anyway. So postmodernism is really looking at, you know, kind of rejecting those ideas from previous, uh, you know, paradigms that kind of say, like, you can know something as a fact or objective truth. It's more the fact that your, what you consider to be fact or truth is going to be framed by your uh, situational experience, right? So like where you are in the hierarchy, like is going to inform your perspective. So if you're like a super rich old white billionaire, like Monty Burns, <laughs> your perspective is going to be a lot different than, you know, a lower middle class white young girl that plays a saxophone like Lisa Simpson, <laughs> right? That's a vegetarian. So obviously your positionality is going to affect how you see the world. I don't know why I use the Simpsons, but I did. Okay. So um, basically they reject a, some uh, these attempts to have a single explanation of like, oh, you just have to do this and then everything will be fine. It's more just the idea of um, kind of understanding and deconstructing what has been falsely constructed for us. And then when it comes to additional feminist perspectives, um, there's ecofeminism, which was developed around the 80s uh, to examine relationships between environmental issues and women's issues. So, you know, basically, they see these issues of domination as the kind of overarching thing that holds that ideology together. So it's not just about domination of women by men through systems like patriarchy, but also the domination of minority groups, right? By uh, majority groups. There's also the domination of animals by humans and the domination of the earth by all of us, right? Which are really essential problems that they see. So within the perspective, though, there's a lot of varieties of ecofeminism. There's radical cultural ecofeminism, spiritual ecofeminism. So really, this idea people say like, oh, feminist you are this or that, but even within feminism, I mean, that's a huge umbrella term. There are so many different pluralities of uh, beliefs and expectations and thoughts and connections about what is most important and kind of schools of thought when it comes to feminism. So, um, you know, if this is the first time you've heard that, then clearly you are <laughs> very undereducated about what feminism is. It's not a catch-all. It's definitely something that is very individualistic and has really developed over um, you know, a few generations now as far as theory. So then global and post-colonial feminism emerges in the mid-70s, and it's an international women's movement. So really, it's trying to look at how women's lives around the world um, have commonalities of experience, such as low economic status, right? 
little power, patriarchal influences. So, you know, they're really critical of westernization of the world, of how, you know, oftentimes patriarchal religions control societies where women aren't allowed to even leave the house without being escorted by someone else. They look at how women are trafficked, like through sex slavery and human trafficking all over the world, right? So really, you know, um, <clears throat> the, the feminists that are in this group that are typically um, from first world nations like ours, heavily industrialized nations, um, they're usually interested in issues revolving around sexuality and reproduction. Um, you know, there's a lot of countries where um, abortion is just illegal, right? Um, actually, there's a really interesting um, podcast on that on Bitch Media called uh, Where Abortion is Illegal, and it's about Chile, and it's really interesting. It's a free podcast if you're interested. Anyway, um, and when it comes to third world feminists, um, basically, these are, you know, economically developing nations. They're also looking at political and economic issues that are developing as a result of the marginalized situations of their specific nation state. So the fact that it's a super complicated situation when you're talking about post-colonialism or really just, you know, uh, you have to understand how colonization as a process was going on in, since like basically like the 1300s to the to like 1970. So it's really it's really interesting like how recent that really is and that post-colonialism is really kind of deconstructing and trying to back up and understand how much the influence of these more powerful nations has exploited and kept um, down through kind of a dominant system somewhat akin to patriarchy, um, people in developing nations for their own benefit, for their own, you know. Um, so it's like wealthy nations like us that we, you know, um, profit off of the exploitation of poor nations that we can extract their resources and not give them fair compensation, right? So it's that kind of thing that they're looking at, but at a larger scale. Okay, so when it comes to traditional theories of female crime, you know, typically it always comes down to that Madonna or whore thing, duality, right? And not Madonna like, <laughs> like the singer, right? <laughs> but this idea of like, women have this double bind kind of situation where you're either considered this perfect, good person, right? Or, you know, you're a horrible, bad person. So, you know, this Madonna image personifies a woman that's submissive, faithful, nurturing mother. The whore is a temptress of men's sexuality. She has no self-control. And of course, inherent in this is a dichotomy between class and racial or ethnic assumptions because this Madonna, this like ideal woman, is restricted to women that are white and rich. So other women that don't fit that category just automatically don't apply, <laughs> right? And it really argues that, you know, black women don't get that dichotomy because they're just essentialized as bad, right? Through these, a lot of these um, stereotypes of black female matriarchs, like the Amazon, right? A domineering, strong, assertive woman. Um, the sapphire, right? This dangerous, castrating, treacherous woman, right? And really also that those, another stereotype that kind of uh, you see in a lot of repeated over within the culture, this kind of mammy stereotype, right? This you know, asexual, overweight, mothering kind of stereotype and the seductress, this immoral, sexually depraved woman. And again, those things are very racialized and it comes from the time period in which it was asserted, right? So really a lot of these cultural understandings that we have of gender and sexuality and, you know, all of that come from a specific time period where um, you have this Victorian era ideal where they instituted what's called the cult of true womanhood, right? Which basically said women should have four virtues, piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity, right? So they set up this kind of ideal of like, here's what a woman should be, but it was only achievable to like wealthy white women anyway. And so it became this idea of like, well, this is who, who a true woman is. So if a woman can't follow these, she's considered bad and, you know, she doesn't have the same, same kind of status in the culture. So really, again, when you look at how Lombroso understood women, this comes in the context of that ideology. So remember, he looked at that kind of, <laughs> Lombroso had the idea you could just like look at a person and see if they were a criminal. 
So if he saw prostitutes that had, you know, um, he basically said that they were more likely to have anomalies like moles or hairiness. <laughs> like I still think hairiness that always cracks me up. I'm like, okay. Um, you know, basically that, that he argued, um, there were prominent cheekbones in women that were murderers, right? Again, all of these things. He, he really thought you could just look at someone and say they're a criminal. So Thomas was basically saying there are basic biological differences between males and females, and that's going to have differences on how they act in relation to crime. So he said that humans essentially have four wishes, the desire for new experiences, the desire for security, the desire for response, and the desire for recognition. So the desire for new experience and desire for response are the ones that were considered the ones that influence criminal behavior. And so he said if a woman goes into prostitution, she's doing it because she has a desire for excitement and response. And that often, you know, he looked at environmental factors as well. So he said that, quote, when crime and prostitution appears as professions, they are the last and most radical expressions of a loss of family and community organization. So he understood that, like, while someone might get a kick or a thrill out of something that's criminal, oftentimes when they're engaging in something like that on a long-term basis of criminality, it's because they have very few other options. So Freud, <sighs> Freud, 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 Freud. So Freud perceived women as anatomically inferior, right? I mean, like, no joke. He literally said that women have penis envy, meaning that women grow up and realize that their equipment doesn't look like a dude's equipment and that they get jealous and upset of a perceived castration. It's very bizarre. Anyway, he was doing a lot of cocaine, but what can you do? So he, you know, basically said that women are inferior because they're more concerned with personal matters and have very little interest in social issues. So with this perspective, you know, a woman who is deviant is one who's attempting to be a man because that's, you know, an inappropriate sex role for her, right? At least that's what he argued. Um, and then Pollock was basically arguing that women have been more criminal in nature than what has been generally perceived by many. But he was saying, you know, criminologists should be addressing the, these questions. So are the crimes in which women are participating exclusively or, you know, often known to be underreported, right? Is that why we're not seeing women represented in crime? Are women offenders generally less detected? The men offenders, right? Because we're not expecting a woman to commit a crime. And then do women, if apprehended, meet with more leniency than do men? So yeah, he was really talking about how criminality of women was largely masked because people didn't think that women were capable. So here's that wrap up of that. Okay, so some critiques uh, that feminists have when studying women in crime of previous research. So first they say research in the social sciences have often ignored women and issues of concern to women. So they've really created these differences between men and women, between girls and boys that are not natural or biological, but have been socially constructed. So in 1977, Carol Smart noted that women have not been entirely ignored in the study of crime and deviance, but stressed the importance of contextualizing female criminality within a broader framework, meaning looking at the influence of moral political, economic, and sexual spheres on women's behavior. From a critical feminist perspective, Nafin conducted an in extensive review of the literature pertaining to female criminality and argued it's essential to understand that by just including women does not necessarily imply the study is using a feminist framework, right? That you can't just like toss in a woman <laughs> and that's enough. Um, basically, when it comes to these you know, concepts, they have what they call add and stir and sex roles. So add and stir is using an existing theoretical perspective and just adding women to it. And many scholars contend that a lot of criminological research does that, right? Where they're like, oh, this is how it works for men. Oh, and also women, right? Kind of the way that they used to do that with um, crash test dummies, which were none of which were women. Like weird things like that, where they didn't do research that it, it all took into account a woman's body being different. And then sex roles really that focus on the social construction of them. So, you know, what we currently call gender roles. So research using that approach has been criticized primarily because there's a tendency perceived like as linked or fixed or determined, meaning that instead of seeing gender roles as something we can either perform or not perform, 
they see that as something that like you're inherently going to do. Like a woman is going to cry, a man is going to hit a person or whatever it is. And not that we're just conditioned to do certain things and people actually perform that gender on quite a spectrum. All right, and this liberation thesis, also called the emancipation hypothesis, attempts to link the women's liberation movement with female crime rates. <laughs> it's great. So basically, they're trying to say like, okay, there's actually a lot of reasons for the changing nature of female crime rates. Two predominant explanations were that with more opportunity for women in the workforce, this opens up an opportunity for certain kinds of crimes that women weren't able to do before, like crimes that take place within the workplace. And also within the changing self-concept and identity of women, because of their consciousness raising aspects of the movements that they were being pushed into other realms where they would, you know, maybe commit crimes that were predominantly male. So, um, you know, during the, during the second wave, there was a lot of different scholars that argued different, you know, understandings of this. So first Adler really said that as women strive for equality with men, they'll have more opportunities to commit crime. Um, again, that kind of occupational issue, the more um, they're able to go up the ladder, the more they're able to, you know, engage in the same kind of crimes that men were doing. Um, you know, Rita Simon was looking at how property crime rates among women increased due to the liberation movement, but violent uh, crime rates did not. So that there's kind of a gendered issue there too. And Nafeen was talking about how there's certain assumptions about women's liberation theory that the liberation movement can be linked to an increase in female crime, right? That's just an assumption. And that an increase in female crime is a function of women becoming more masculine so that it's just, oh, as women become more like men, they commit more crime, right? So that's, again, the assumption that men by their basis just commit crime. And so, um, again, that assumption that women, it has to do with them becoming more active, but really... You know, she says there's a lot of problems with those assumptions, including the assumption about the relationship between enhanced structural opportunities and increase in offending rates, because when they actually do the statistics on this, they found that women obviously haven't achieved equality in high paying and managerial positions. So they're not put in those positions of power to be like a Bernie Madoff or whatever. And, you know, there's a lot of criticisms of these kind of things because they say that they, this assumption that gender equality is producing crime. Okay, so power control theory is coming from Hagen, who's really trying to incorporate conflict theory and social control theory to understand, you know, these kind of feminist dynamics. So um, basically, they're trying to look at gender differences in delinquency rates, and often by looking at family dynamics. So really, he argued that youths from families that were more patriarchal, where a mom had a lower status than a dad, had greater gender differences in delinquency rates um, compared to youths from more egalitarian homes. So meaning, you know, if um, the mom and dad had the same status or if the mom was the only parent in the home. So they were talking about how this relationship between family dynamics and gender was related to delinquency rates. So if you have more of a power dynamic uh, between men and women in your household, you're going to be more restrictive of your daughter to go out and do stuff, um, but less restrictive of your son. So that's going to create kind of a gender difference in that, in those rates of um, delinquency. Okay, so feminist perspectives to understanding crime and criminal behavior. So Sandra Harding provided three characteristics or features that distinguish feminist research. So first is that the empirical and theoretical bases come from women's actual experiences. So that, you know, that basically they're challenging those assumptive white European middle class male kind of perspective. Um, and the second feature of feminist analysis was the new purpose for women, whereas traditional analysis would have primarily been for men. So just looking at women and how they differ as a population. And the final characteristic of feminist research was looking at the researcher in the same critical plane as the subject matter. So that, that's where objectivity and subjectivity come in, um, which are super important if you get to the level of doing sociological research. That's kind of like mandatory at this point. So really feminist scholars challenge research claims of objectivity. So we have this idea that 
research is objective. Um, but what, you know, these kind of feminist critics are saying is that while the research itself can go through rigorous um, scientific method processes, different methodological approaches that can ensure a limited amount of bias onto the results, how, what question you ask, how you arrive at that question, the scope of your research, all of these things are very subjective. So the idea of objectivity that, you know, you're just completely outside of yourself and asking a question and being completely outside of the research and objective to it, it just doesn't exist, right? So the only way you can do research and make sure that you are not affecting it negatively is what they call reflexivity, which is basically putting yourself into the research saying like, here's why I'm coming to the research. Here are my biases. So people, when they read the research, they can take that into account as a counter to your perspective that may or may not make its way into that research. So, you know, oftentimes we think that all of these things are just objective, right? But that's the reason that people thought that uh, homosexuality was a mental disease until the 1970s, right? Because it was considered, well, these scientists did objective research, but they didn't do objective research, right? They were coming from a presupposed notion that homosexuality was somehow a defect or something wrong right? So again, how you frame the research, how you look at the research, what approach you have towards it is often very subjective and not objective. So it's important to kind of acknowledge that within, you know, how research is done and how you operate methodologically. Okay, so when it comes to qualitative versus quantitative analyses, basically, you know, there's different methods that you can use to ex understand and experience, you know, understand people's experiences. So Quantitative is usually looking at those larger scale pictures, but, you know, a lot of feminist uh, methodological approaches are qualitative, and that's because those are smaller scale, more personal things, like often like interviews or things of that nature where, um, you know, it's a closed group. You get to really explore someone's meanings and understandings of how they felt, what they experienced, etc. versus like if you take a survey and they're like, do you agree? Do you strongly agree? Right? Those kind of things. You don't get to explain why you agree or why you strongly agree. So um, oftentimes qualitative kind of gets at that. And then um, when it comes to feminist criminology, this really evolved primarily from liberal feminists. So um, early feminist criminology argued that, you know, crime analyses should have a consideration of gender. Um, so they tried to do the following. They basically um, tried to look at the scientific basis for criminal behavior, but re-examine the gender and racial and ethnic biases that are going on alongside of it to develop a new definition of crime. So Daly and uh, Chesney Lind identified the following five elements that distinguish feminist thought from other forms of social and political thought. So the first being that gender is not a natural fact but it's a complex social, historical, and cultural product. It's related to, but it's not simply derived from biological sex differences and reproductive capacity. Um, second, that gender and gender relations um, order social lives and order um, our social institutions in fundamental ways. So they really shape the context and understandings within those institutions. Also that gender relations are constructs that come from, you know, these kind of constructs that we have of masculinity, of femininity. Those are really just expectations put on us. Those don't come from our internal desires or beliefs of who we actually are, right? So um, those are just portrayals that we, are, we feel we have to live up to. And so um, basically they argue that they're based on an organizing principle where men are superior in those social, political, and economic ways. And so they, they talk about how systems of knowledge that exist that are considered truth and fact actually more often reflect men's views of the natural and social world because women have so long been excluded from those kind of um, power centers of, you know, the social, political, or economic power. Um, so the production of knowledge itself is gendered. And they say that women should be at the center of intellectual inquiry, not peripheral, not invisible, not as an appendage or a token, but that they are going to see things that others aren't because of their different positionality. All right. 
So there's a little wrap up there. Okay, so critiques. So um, basically, uh, Burgess Proctor identified key conceptual factors that distinguish multiracial feminism from other feminist perspectives. So basically, this comes about because in the 60s, women of color are challenging feminism because they're arguing that these perspectives, while, you know, are positive in some ways, are really only focusing on middle class white women. So multiracial feminism claims that gender relations do not exist in a vacuum, right? Men and women are also characterized by their race, by their class, by their sexuality, by their age, by their physical ability, by their, you know, nationality, whatever it is, by a bunch of stuff as other, you know, social locations of inequality. Also, multiracial feminism argues the importance of recognizing the ways in which intersecting systems of power and privilege interact on all social structural levels. So again, that intersectionality we've been discussing. And multiracial feminism is founded on the concept of relationality. So basically assuming that groups of people are socially situated in relation to each other based on their differences. So another issue that's been raised by feminist scholars is when conducting research on women, it is essential that one avoid placing these women as either offenders or victims. So this has been referred to as what they call blurred boundaries theory of victimization and criminalization. And also uh, Lisa Marr critiqued both traditional and feminist research with respect to the importance of not overemphasizing or ignoring women's agency. So again, kind of a more traditional approach often overlooks how women's marginalization often places them in a situation where they are active subjects who pursue criminal opportunities. Meaning like if you are poor and living in a bad neighborhood and you have a little economic opportunities and you actually go out and seek to sell drugs, right? That kind of goes against those expectations. So, you know, really on the other end of the spectrum, they're more associated with these kind of ideas of, you know, um, using a feminist paradigm, looking at research, not just kind of throwing women in the mix at the end, but really just kind of approaching it from understanding that it's not just this gender aspect, it's your race, it's your class, it's all of these kind of things that inform who you are. As you can't really split those identities in your lived experience, that's also how you're interpreted when you come in contact to the criminal justice system, whether or not you're deviant or whether or not, you know, you're considered someone who's not deviant. So it is important to really analyze these things when understanding, and again, looking at the social context of the movements of feminism themselves and their goals and movement and, and ideals in informing and an understanding of this feminist perspective of criminology.